What is going on, Meatball Nation? Today I'm putting on my nerd glasses with the tape right here. I'm putting on some fancy ties for me and Meatball, and today we are going to talk about the hearing testimony right before the hearing actually happens. This is straight out of Melvin's mouth, as well as our Deep Effing Valley Roaring Kitty's mouth, uh, the martyr, the man, and uh, both of these statements are already out here for you to peruse. I'm going to walk through with them to give you guys a full sense of exactly Exactly what is at stake right now before tomorrow's hearing. If you guys like it, I really appreciate a like for the algorithm so that other apes find this video just as you did. And without further ado, let us cover the hearing testimony of uh, a Mr. Gabriel Plotkin. Uh, um, glasses on. And let's get started. Hearing before the United States House of Representatives Committee on Financial Services, February 18th, 2021. Testimony of Gabriel Plotkin, founder and chief investment officer, Melvin Capital Management. If you guys aren't aware, this is one of the big hedge funds, the big, big hedge funds that decided to short GME and got us into this mess to begin with and uh, how we are raging against the institutions. Uh, we really also are trying to say Melvin specifically. Chairwoman Waters, ranking member McHenry and members of the committee, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share Melvin Capital's perspective on the recent trading activity in GameStop. I am the founder and chief investment officer of Melvin Capital. I am humbled by these unprecedented events. Many investors on all sides have experienced the losses. I am here today to share my personal experience and to be helpful in this conversation. I understand that part of the focus of this hearing is the decisions of stock trading platforms to limit trading in GameStop. I want to make clear that the outset uh, that Melvin Capital played absolutely no role in those trading platforms' decisions. In fact, Melvin closed out all of its positions in GameStop days before platforms put those limitations in place. Like you, we learned about those limits from news reports. I also want to make clear at the outset that contrary to many reports, Melvin Capital was not bailed out in the midst of these events. Citadel proactively reached out to become a new investor similar to the investments others make in our fund. It was an opportunity for Citadel to buy low and earn returns for its investors and when our funds value went up to be sure melvin was managing through a difficult time but we always had margin excess and we were not seeking a cash infusion my background melvin capital i am here testifying today far removed from my background i grew up in a middle class family in portland maine i went to a public high school i studied hard and got into a good college upon graduation i did not have a job today i am married with four children and my time is spent with my family and on melvin capital which i founded six years ago i named melvin after my grandfather who ran a convenience store i wanted the firm to represent his values integrity hard work taking care of customers and employees and commitment to excellence melvin capital manages a hedge fund. Investors such as academic institutions, medical research, and other charitable foundations, pension funds, retirees, and others invest with us. We have 36 employees and hundreds of investors, and I feel a personal duty to all of them. Melvin Capital's Long Short Investment Strategy Melvin specializes in the consumer and technology sector, including companies like GameStop, AutoZone, and Expedia. Most of our investments are long. In other words, we buy stock in companies that create jobs, grow the economy, and develop new products for consumers. We do this after extensive fundamental research, sometimes literally for years. When our research convinces us that a company will grow relative to expectations, we make a long-term investment. When our research suggests a company will not live up to its expectations and its stock price is overvalued, we might short a stock. They really might short a stock. Like with our long positions, our practice is to short a stock for the long term after extensive research. We also short stocks because when the markets go down, we have a duty to protect our investors' capital. There are laws governing shorting stocks, and of course, we always follow them. In addition... <laughs> Sorry, couldn't, almost couldn't keep a straight face. In addition, it is very important to understand that absolutely none of Melvin's short positions are part of any effort to artificially depress or manipulate downward the price of a stock. And nothing about our short positions prevents a company from achieving its objectives. It is just Melvin's view about whether it will. GameStop position. Specific to GameStop, we had a research-supported view well before the recent events. In fact, we had been short GameStop since Melvin's inception six years earlier because we believe 
believe and still believe that its business model, selling new and used video games in physical stores, is being overtaken by digital downloads through the internet. And that trend only accelerated in 2020 when, because of the pandemic, people were downloading video games at home. As a result, the gaming industry had its best year ever, but GameStop had significant losses. January frenzy untethered to fundamentals. In January 2021, a group on Reddit began to make posts about Melvin's specific investments. They took information contained in Melvin's SEC filings and encouraged others to trade in the opposite direction. Many of these posts are laced with anti-Semitic slurs directed at me and others. The post said things like, it's very clear we need a second Holocaust. Oh, I cannot say any of those things. Uh, others sent similarly profane and racist text messages to me. In the frenzy during January, GameStop stock rose from $17 to a peak $483. I do not think anyone would claim that price had any relationship to the intrinsic value of the company. Interesting. The unfortunate part of this episode is that ordinary investors who were convinced by a misleading frenzy to buy GameStop at $100, $200, this guy, or even $483, have now lost significant amounts. When this frenzy began, Melvin started closing out his positions in GameStop at a loss, not because our investment thesis had changed, but because something unprecedented was happening. We also reduced many other Melvin positions at significant losses, both long and short, and that was the subject of similar posts. Looking ahead, I am personally humbled by what happened in January. Investors in Melvin suffered significant losses. It is our job to earn it back. And while I do not think that anyone could have anticipated these events, I have learned much from them. And I am taking steps to protect our investors from anything like this happening in the future. I look forward to answering your questions. Well, before we move on to uh, our protagonist's testimony, first of all, uh, we have to say that hopefully all of this is true. It would be perjury if Mr. Melvin says something that is actually not true. Uh, and it seems like he is claiming that Melvin Capital has closed its positions already. Something else important about it is that a lot of this testimony is tied to emotion, how he grew up uh, and had no job under upon graduation, and uh, and his grandpa was the, the person that uh, he named his company after. That's really nice. He also elicits some emotion when he talks about anti-Semitic slurs. Of course, none of you apes believe that stuff. Uh, in, or, and I'm actually hearing about this for the first time because uh, I honestly don't spend a lot of time on Wall Street bets except for doing due diligence. So that is Mr. Melvin's case. So what is the testimony of Mr. Keith Patrick Gill, otherwise known as Roaring Kitty, otherwise known as Deep Effing Value? I need a different costume for that. All right. We like the stonk. Testimony of Keith Patrick Gill before the U.S. House Committee on Financial Services. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee. Boom. <laughs> before I go further, I want to be clear about what I am not. I am not a hedge fund. I am an individual investor. My investment in GameStop and my posts on social media were entirely my own. I did not solicit anyone to buy or sell the stock for my own profit. I did not belong to any groups trying to create movements in the stock price. I never had a financial relationship with any hedge fund. I had no information about GameStop except that what was public. I did not know any people inside the company and I never spoke to any insider. As an individual investor, I use publicly available information to study the market and the value of specific companies. I consider a complex array of factors and track hundreds of stocks, all in search of market inefficiencies. Like many people, sometimes I post on social media my thoughts and analysis about individual stocks and whether they are correctly valued. I did that with GameStop. I believe the company was dramatically undervalued by the market uh, the prevailing analysis about GameStop's impending doom was simply wrong. A little about my background. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. My father was a truck driver, my mom a registered nurse. I was one of three kids and the first in my family to earn a four-year college degree when I graduated from Stonehill College in 2009 amidst the Great Recession and without a long-term job. Seems like he had something in common with Mr. Melvin. My first post-college job was in operations at W.B. Mason, an office supplies company headquartered in my hometown of Brockton. Before 2010 and 2014, I worked with a family friend at a startup company in New Hampshire trying to build a software program that would help investors analyze stocks and offer related research. We also start, tried to start an investment firm, which dissolved not long after it was created. My salary never exceeded $40,000, but I did learn something about investing. I learned how to do the tedious work of digging through a company's financials and focusing on its real long-term value, not prevailing market sentiment or headlines. I married my wife, Caroline, in 2016 and found a job working operations and compliance at 
Lex shares. I left that job in March 2017, and for the next two years, I was in effectively without a job. During that time, I began actively analyzing a wide array of stocks to try and keep and increase our limited savings. It was both a way to make money and an interest that I pursued passionately while I lacked a job. In April 2019, I accepted a marketing and financial education job at Mass Mutual. Caroline and I were both happy about our prospects. I had never made a job of over $100,000 a year before, and I was thrilled just to be working and have benefits again. My title was Director of Financial Wellness Education. My job was to help develop financial education classes that advisors could present to prospective clients. I never sold securities and I was not a financial advisor. I continued analyzing stocks on my own time and investing my family's funds. In early June of 2019, the price of GameStop stock declined on worse than expected earnings and it began trading at a deep discount below what I thought was its fair value. I was aware from public reports that a well-known investor, Michael Burry, was interested in GameStop. Because I thought the stock was undervalued, I purchased call options on June 7th, 2019. I increased my position throughout much of 2019 and 2020 because as I continued to analyze the company and its prospects, I became increasingly confident that the share price was indeed dramatically undervalued. Two important factors based entirely on publicly available information gave me and many others confidence that GameStop was undervalued in 2019 and 2020. First, the market was underestimating the prospects of GameStop's legacy business and overestimating the likelihood of its going bankrupt. GameStop, the only major retailer dedicated to gaming, has over 60 million members in its loyalty program and continues to maintain a size market share within the gaming industry. Its legacy business, comprised primarily of selling physical video games and related equipment within their stores, was likely to generate meaningful cash flow during the release of new gaming consoles in late 2020. I grew up playing video games and shopping at GameStop, and I'm looking forward to buying a new console at GameStop. I knew the company had an opportunity to reinvigorate their business by improving customer service for gamers, upgrading its online presence, and offering complementary product lines such as PC gaming and accessories. Second, I believe and I continue to believe that GameStop has the potential to reinvent itself as the ultimate destination for gamers with the thrive within the thriving $200 billion gaming industry. The new console cycle provides GameStop a unique opportunity to pivot from a traditionally brick and mortar mindset toward a technology driven business that excels in gaming products, experiences and services. By embracing the digital economy, GameStop can pursue new revenue streams, including larger gaming catalogs, digital content and community experiences, online trade-ins, uh, streaming services, and esports. While I may be the only panelist here today who had faith in GameStop, I was hardly the only person who advocated these points or once liked them. Investors including Chewy co-founder Ryan Cohen, whose purchase of GameStop shares and advocacy with the GameStop board helped positively affect the share price in late 2020, publicly expressed similar views. I want to pause to note that the investment I made was risky but I was confident in my analysis and I was willing to accept the loss if I was proven wrong. My timing was far from perfect and many of the options contracts I purchased expired worthless because GameStop's stock price remained depressed longer than I expected. I've been asked why I decided to share my investment ideas on social media. My investment skills had reached a level where I felt sharing them publicly could help others. I also thought that by sharing my own ideas and accepting critiques, I would be able to identify holes in my analysis. Hedge funds and other Wall Street firms have teams of analysts working together in com to compile research and critique investment ideas, while individual investors have not had that advantage. Social media Social media platforms like YouTube, Twitter, and Wall Street Bets on Reddit are leveling the playing field. And in a year of quarantines and COVID, engaging with other investors on social media was a safe way to socialize. We had fun. The idea that I use social media to promote GameStop stock to unwitting investors is preposterous. I was abundantly clear that my channel was for educational purposes only and that my aggressive style of investing was unlikely to be suitable for most folks checking out the channel. Whether other investors uh, in hope oh, whether other, whether other individual investors bought the stock was irrelevant to my thesis. My focus was on the fundamentals of the business. It's worth noting that after five months of streaming, my final stream of 2020 topped out at just 96 current. <laughs> my final stream of 2020 topped out at 90. 
It's worth noting that after five months of streaming, my final stream of 2020 topped out at just 96 concurrent viewers with an average view duration of 25 minutes. On Christmas morning, I had only 529 subscribers on YouTube and 550 followers on Twitter. These numbers are tiny. There were rarely more than a few dozen folks on my stream on any night. The reality was people didn't really care about boring, repetitive analysis of GameStop and other stocks, and that was fine. For those of us who did care, the stream provided us an outlet for refining our fundamental based thesis. We were able to analyze events in real time and keep each other honest. Ultimately, my GameStop investment was a success. But the thing is, I felt that way in December, far before the peak when the stock was at $20 a share. I was so happy to visit my family in Brockton for the... I was so happy to visit my family in Brockton for the holidays and give them the great news. We were millionaires. That money will go such a long way for my family. We had an incredibly difficult 2020. In addition to dealing with COVID, we lost my sister Sarah unexpectedly in June. It brought me tremendous joy to share good news with my family for a change. I am grateful to be able to give back to my community and support my family, most of all my wife Caroline, who stuck with me through very tough times. As for what happened in January, others will have to explain it. Threshold lists. I'll Threshold lists, order flow, halting purchases, according to the media, these all had a material impact on GameStop stock in January. Here's the thing. I've had a bit of experience and even I barely understand these matters. It's alarming how little we know about the inner workings of the market and I am thankful that this committee is examining what happened. I believe an analysis of GameStop's recent price action must start with a discussion of the exorbitant short interest in the stock as well as an investigation into any potentially manipulative shorting practices and brokers report failures to timely deliver shares and settle trades. As for what I expect moving forward, GameStop stock price may have gone a bit ahead of itself last month, but I'm as bullish as I've ever been on the potential turnaround. In short, I like the stock. And what's stunning is that, as far as I can tell, the market remains oblivious to GameStop's unique opportunity within the gaming industry. My boy. Well, if you've learned anything from his testimony, it's that uh, this guy still likes the stock. He talks a lot about his family, talks a lot about the emotional pleas as well, which kind of gives you an idea of what congressional hearings are all about. But most importantly, if he likes the stock, so do we. If you want a shirt, go ahead and check out the description down below. I don't make them, I just wear them, uh, but it does go to GME, uh, the profits, so that goes to a good cause. If you guys like the channel, I really appreciate if you came over from the Bruce Wayne gang. Welcome. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that like button for me. And until next time, for now but not for forever, I appreciate you guys. Have a good one. Peace.